Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. I am Joseph F. Alsis, Addiction Master on most social media. I'm going to be continuing my talk about alien civilizations and the possibility of them. This is going to be The Great Filter. Now, I guess you can track this type of thing through a lot of my sciences podcasts. That'll be the playlist this will be in. But I was having a conversation with a friend. It got into a multi-day, multiple conversations. We were actually acting like reporters, trying to figure things out. And we started getting into this um, debate, conversation about alien civilizations, the possibility of them, and kind of tying it into what was going on in this day and age with disclosure from the government, etc. So this will be the fourth one, I believe. In this series, I have um, the Drake Equation, the Fermi Paradox, and the Dark Forest Theory. This will be the fourth, like I said. I might do a couple more if I find them. What happens is it, a lot of these little rabbit holes lead to other things that are really interesting. So I have the Great Filter I'm going to do today. But I might do two websites. I'm not sure because one's a little more concise and uh, easy to understand. The other one seemed a little more flitty and out there in some aspects. So, like normal, I'll put the link to any of the websites I use in the description. I usually read it word for word. I might stop here and there, interject some of my thoughts, and then at the end, kind of give an overview of what I think it could mean. So, the first article I will be. Reading is from astronomy.com. The Great Filter, a possible solution to the Fermi Paradox. There are many major hurdles to becoming an interplanetary species, but one might be tougher than the rest. By Doug Adler. All right. I will begin now with, oh, there's a little caption here. The Great Filter Theory suggests that all life must overcome certain challenges. And at least one hurdle is nearly impossible to clear. In 1950, the physicist and Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi famously asked his colleagues, where are they? Fermi had been reflecting upon the vastness of the cosmos, and they, in his question, referred to extraterrestrials. With an almost unfathomable number of stars and planets in the universe, it seemed obvious that intelligent civilizations capable of developing radio astronomy and interstellar travel should speckle the distant stars. Yet in Fermi's day, no evidence of such civilizations existed, something that still holds true today. The Fermi paradox is the term used to describe the lack of evidence for extraterrestrial life in the face of a universe that should be, by the numbers, bursting with it. We see... No signs of alien technology, and our radio telescopes don't pick up voices from other worlds. Many hypotheses have been proposed to resolve the Fermi Paradox, but all of these remain unproven. And in the 1990s, another possible explanation for our apparent aloneness in the universe was formulated by Robin Hansen, a postulate that has become known as the Great Filter. As with other articles I read, there are some highlighted um, words and underlined that lead you to other links. It's a good way to confirm certain things, so just get an understanding from the understanding and aspect of what they're talking about. Okay, I will continue. The hurdles to interplanetary life. Simply stated, the Great Filter says that intelligent interstellar life forms must first take many critical steps, and at least one of these steps must be highly improbable. Indeed, the premise of the Great Filter is that there is at least one hurdle that is so high, virtually no species can clear it and move on to the next. But while the term the Great Filter suggests the conscious action of some sort of ex exonerous entity, exogenous en entity, oh boy, 
In reality, the hypothesis is more of a way of thinking about the relative likelihood of certain events happening or not happening in their own natural course. So what basic hurdles must be cleared in order to become a fully advanced spacefaring civilization? Hansen just suggested a few paraphrase below. A planet capable of harboring life must form in a star's habitable zone. Life must develop on that planet. Those life forms must be able to reproduce using such molecules as DNA and RNA. Now you notice it says such molecules. They're finding out there's lots of other ways life forms could, could arise. Simple cells, prokaryotes, must evolve into more complex cells, eukaryotes. Multicellular organisms must develop. Sexual reproduction, which greatly increases genetic diversity, must take hold. Complex organisms capable of using tools must evolve. Those organisms must create advanced technology needed for space colonization. This is roughly where humans are today. The spacefaring species must go on to colonize other worlds and star systems while avoiding destroying them itself. Those were the points. I'll continue again. While humans are not yet capable of interstellar travel in any meaningful sense, beyond a full few small robotic probes like the Pioneer, Voyager, and New Horizon spacecraft, we are capable of advanced radio astronomy, meaning we're a relatively tech-savvy civilization. But even if it took the same inordinate amount of time for an alien civilization to make the technological leaps humanity has, given the age of the universe, there should be at least a few interplanetary species colonizing their entire galaxy by now. But again, astronomers see no evidence of such civilizations. When they look to the stars, the silence is deafening. The biggest challenges to becoming a galactic civilization. Uh, there's a little caption under a nice image. The Great Filter is so difficult to identify because, among other reasons, other worlds experience widely different environments than Earth. This artist's concept depicts what they view may take place on a planet in the Trappist-1 system. So it's just an artistic representation. There's an image here. And I will continue. So what could the Great Filter be? Well, be, well, perhaps a biogenesis, life arising from lifelessness, is widely uncommon. Perhaps the extreme rarity of this event is in the fact the great filter. Alternatively, perhaps a common for life to spontaneous arise. Or perhaps it's common for life to spontaneous arise. But the overwhelming majority of life never progresses beyond simple single-cell organisms. Maybe the universe is teeming with bacteria, but bacteria don't build starships. Alternatively, the Great Filter might be a consequence of technology itself. Perhaps advanced civilizations usually eradicate themselves via some sort of technology, run amok, such as malevolent artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, or a doomsday machine. <laughs> Humanity is already more than capable of destroying itself via global thermonuclear war. And sadly, it's possible that such extinction events are virtually inevitable throughout the cosmos. Interesting. Lots of science fiction movies right there have been made. The Great Filter could also be a purely outside event that is not dependent on the species it's testing, regardless of how advanced they may be. For instance... The impact of a giant asteroid or rogue planet, a nearby gamma ray burst, or an intrusive supernova could potentially annihilate all life on Earth. Or any other planet for that matter. No technology in our arsenal today could stop these events from occurring, even if we had forewarning. Another possibility is that more than just one step of the Great Filter is extremely unlikely to occur. This would exponentially increase the difficulty of a civilization achieving the level of technology required to master interstellar travel. 
Has humanity passed the Great Filter? If the Great Filter is behind us, though, it bodes well for humanity as a species. The universe may be ours for the taking. If, however, the Great Filter still lies ahead, we may be doomed. <laughs> ah, fun times. On the bright side, some have interpreted our apparent aloneness in the universe as a good sign. A blessing, even. As it indicates, we've safely made it through the bottleneck. Strange as it may seem, we may be the first species to have passed through the Great Filter. After all, someone has to be the first. On the other hand, if we were to detect a signal from a super advanced technological species that makes us look primitive, it might imply the Great Filter still lies ahead. Humanity could be destined to take a surprise cosmic test, one that we don't know what to study for. The Great Filter is only a theory, yes, but from a logical perspective, it is an appealing idea on many levels, offering a plausible explanation to the Fermi Paradox. So, although the questions of where are they still remains unanswered, the Great Filter Theory offers one of the best guesses we can dream up. Unfortunately, that doesn't answer, the, that doesn't answer whether the Great Filter is already in our rearview mirror. And that ends this article. Fascinating. So, there were challenges like we don't know what it could be. It could be us. It could be an outside influence. So, and all these equations, and I've gone through some of them, I don't know what the fuck they mean, okay? I'm not that bright. But when you look at the odds of things becoming a possibility or probability, other factors are weighing in. So is it all these hurdles you have to go through as a species to evolve, and then an asteroid hits your planet, or is it most common that a rogue planet comes in and a neutron star? Uh, how about a black hole racing across the universe, which I've done a podcast on? There are so many things. But I like the way it says, there's a looking at it as a logical thing, okay, maybe it's in our review mirror. Maybe we have gotten to the bottleneck. We've gone through that... Um, great filter and it could be something we had no control over was it a biogenesis and how life came from lifelessness on some primordial soup with lightning and whatever the fuck uh, if it's carried in just a culmination of planets colliding in different elements and minerals and gases and liquids from other things interacting in a really bizarre way it could be it could be anything like that. So I am really thrilled. I get really hyped up for this type of stuff, and especially our conversation. It was hilarious. Um, now, the second one I was looking because I was going to do, I had to both bookmarked. This one was called, this article is called Beyond Fermi's Paradox 3. What is the Great Filter? I mean, I'll, I'll, try, I'll, I'll try to do this quick. I'll get through this. Uh, Welcome back to our Fermi, Do Fermi Paradox series. Well, that's kind of what I was doing. Where we take a look at the possible resolutions to Enrico Fame, Fermi's famous question. Where is everybody? Today we examine the possibility that there is something in the universe that prevents life from reaching the point where we are able to hear from it. I kind of went through this, right? So in 1950, da, 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 where is everybody? This became the basis. Okay, so... So what di what differences that mark these out to me? I, was, I wasn't sure which article I was going to read. The other one had better bold typing. It was easy to see. This has a lot of really cool links, though. So, for instance, the paradox, uh, Fermi Paradox series. I just have to click the link, and it opens up to their whole series on the, the Fermi Paradox and so on and so forth. All right, so I did the Dark Forest hypothesis. Anyway, um... Continuing down, it says origins. The term was coined by economist Robin Hanson, who was also a research associate at Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute, FHI. In 1996, Hanson published an essay titled The Great Filter. Oh, we almost passed it. Where he proposed that there must be something that prevents non-living matter from coming together to form living organisms, abiogenesis, and reaching a high level of development on the 
Kodeshev scale. See below. There's a link to a video. See, this is what I was interested in. The Kardashev scale. Hmm. This possibility, he claimed, does not bode well for humanity, as he summarized his argument. Humanity seems to have a bright future, i.e. a non-trivial chance of expanding to fill the universe with lasting life. But the fact that space near us seems dead now tells us that many, that any given piece of dead matter faces an astronomically low chance of begetting such a future. There thus exists a great filter between death and the expanding lasting life and humanity faces the ominous question how far along this filter are we another great description was offered by nick bostrom a philosopher who also hails from the h f h i as he described in his 2008 essay where are they why i hope the search for extraterrestrial intelligence finds nothing i might have done a podcast on that by the way about it this is by matt williams i forgot to say who it was from and it's the website is uh, universitytoday.com. Uh, all right, so I was going to Nick Bostrom's words. The gray filter can be thought of as a po- probability barrier. A probability barrier. It consists of one or more highly improbable evolutionary transitions or steps whose occurrence is required in order for an Earth like planet to produce an intelligent civilization of a type that would be visible to us with our current observation technology. Gotta love the Drake. When Fermi posted his famous question, scientists were already operating under the assumption that life must be plentiful in the universe. This should come as no surprise given the sheer size of the universe, which measures 93 billion light years in diameter. That's just the observable part. And has been around for an estimated 13.8 billion years. <laughs> With that, space is an estimated 2 trillion galaxies. Our own galaxy, meanwhile, measures between 170,000 and 200,000 light years in diameter and contains between 200 and 400 billion stars. Even if we were to assume that only 1% of those stars had planets, that 1% of those planets could support life, that 1% of them produced intelligent life, and that 1% of this life blossomed to an advanced civilization, that means, that still means 2,000 civilizations could be out there. This argument was formalized about a decade later by American astronomer and SETI researcher, Dr. Frank Drake. During a meeting at the Green Bank facility in 1961, a neuroscientist met to discuss the use of radio telescopes to search for signals that appeared to be artificial in origin. In preparation for this meeting, Drake prepared an equation that summed up what SETI researchers were working with. The Drake equation, and it would be there after be called, can be summarized mathematically as follows. I've done a whole podcast on this. N equals R is whatever. X, F, P, X, N, E, X, F, something or other. X, F, whatever. F, C, L. And it goes through. I did this already. So this is why I went with the other one, too. There's a... Uh, whole description of where N is the number of civilizations in a galaxy. We could communicate with R, blah, blah, blah. So I've done that. I'm going to continue. I'm sorry. If you like the article, I'll put this link in too. As Dr. Drake would later say of the equation's creation, as I planned the meeting, I realized a few days ahead of time we needed an agenda. So I wrote down all the things you needed to know to predict how hard it's going to be to detect extraterrestrial life. And looking at them, it became pretty evident that if you multiplied all these together, you got a number N, which is the number of detectable civilizations in our galaxy. This was aimed at the radio search and not to search for primordial or primitive life forms. A question of scale. The Kardashev scale takes its name from the Soviet and Russian astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev, who proposed that extraterrestrial civilizations could be classified based on the amount of energy it's able to harness. In his 1964 essay titled Transmission of Information by Extraterrestrial Civilizations, he proposed a three-tiered scheme, the Kardashev scale, that consisted of the following. Type 1 civilizations, aka planetary civilizations, are those that can use 
and store all the energy available on its planet. There's a fucking equation there. In, in parentheses, minus 4 times 10 to the 12 watts. Then it's type 2 civilizations, a.k.a. stellar civilizations, are those that are capable of using and controlling the energy of its entire star system. Again, in parentheses, minus 4, 10 to the 26th watts. Type 3 civilizations, a.k.a. galactic civilizations, are those that can control the energy of an entire galaxy. Again, parentheses, minus 4, times 10 to the 37th watts. Okay. And there's a little link to the Dyson Sphere. I had a, that was a big, uh, funny conversation I had also with her. In his 1973 book titled The Cosmic Connection, An Extraterrestrial Perspective, famed science communicator Carl Sagan claimed that there should be a type zero included on the scale, since humanity had not yet achieved a type one level of development, as Sagan put it. Quote, a Type 1 civilization is able to muster for communications purposes the equivalent of the entire present power output of the planet Earth, which is now being used for heating, electricity, transportation, and so on. A large variety of purposes other than communication with extraterrestrial civilizations. By this definition, the Earth is not yet a Type 1 civilization. Our present civilization would be classified as something like Type 0 0.7. <laughs> I love Carl Sagan. Based on these parameters, a Type 1 civilization would not have only grown to occupy the entire surface area of its planet, but would have also colonized low Earth orbit, LEO. Such a civilization could be identified by exoplanet hunters looking for clouds of satellites around the planet, aka clock belts, which would be visible during planetary transits. A Type 2 civilization, according to Kardashev, is best exemplified as one that is capable of, capable of building a megastructure around its home star, i.e. a Dyson Sphere. This would allow a civilization to harness all the energy produced by its sun, as well as multiplying the amount of habitable, habitable space in its home system exponentially. There's a fucking picture with lots of... Oh, the wow signal. Okay, the wow signal represents... As C E Q U J five blah blah blah, that was a big thing back in the day. And maybe I'll do a podcast on that too. A Type three civilization is harder to characterize, but various theorists have argued that a sufficiently advanced ETIs could build megastructures around their entire galaxy, or around the core region of their galaxy, in order to harness the energy of its supermassive black hole, SMBH. Regardless, it is fair to say that a civilization capable of harnessing the energy of its entire galaxy would be impossible not to notice. Where to draw the line? In his essay, Hansen argued that the filter must lie somewhere between the point where life emerges on the planet, abiogenesis, and the point where it becomes an interplanetary or interstellar civilization. Using life on Earth as the emergence of humanity as a template, Hansen outlined a nine-step process that life would need to follow to reach the point of becoming a spacefaring civilization. These included a habitable star system, organics and habitable planets, reproductive molecules, e.g. RNA, prokaryotic single-cell life, eukaryotic single-cell life, sexual reproduction, multi-cell life, animals capable of using tools, industrial civilization, wide-scale colonization. You've gone through that in a previous article I did in this podcast. In accordance with the Great Filter Hypothesis, at least one of these steps must be improbable. Either life has a difficult time emerging from inorganic materials early on, or the odds of catastrophic failure increase as a species becomes more and more advanced. Either one of these possibilities has significant consequences for the human race. You can watch a video on the Great Filter on YouTube, which is cool. If the filter is an early step, then the existence of complex life forms, including humans, is a rarity, and we beat the odds just by being here. If, on the other hand, the Great Filter is located at a later step, then many ETIs must have reached our current level of development, but failed to progress further, for whatever reason. This could mean that the point where extinction becomes likely lies ahead of us. For that reason, there are many who feel that the discovery of life beyond Earth 
would not be a reason to celebrate, or as Nick Bostrom summarized. You start with billions and billions of potential germanization points for life, and you end up with a sum total of zero extraterrestrial civilizations that we can observe. The Great Filter must therefore be powerful enough, which is to say, the critical steps must be improbable enough, that even with many billions rolls of the dice, one ends up with nothing, no aliens, no spacecraft, no signals. At least none that we can detect in our neck of the woods. End quote. In any case, it's a foregone conclusion that no species in our galaxy has reached the ninth step. Otherwise, the evidence of its existence would be everywhere. So it's entirely possible that intelligent species don't make the transition from step 8 to step 9. So it's entirely possible that intelligent species don't make it from step 8 to step 9, i.e. type 1 to type 2 civilizations. Did I read that fucking twice? I was looking at the fucking thing for the Permian Paradox debate. <laughs> Possible resolutions. In the end, the Great Filter and the Fermi Paradox are inseparable, and attempts to resolve one invariably intrude on the other. For example, placing the filter at an early stage in Hans's nine-step process would be to conclude that humanity has, n has found no evidence of intelligent life because it does not exist, which is the very basis of the Hart-Tipler conjecture. A link to that. There you go. On the other hand, if it's the case that intelligent life exists out there, but the conditions under which it developed are rare, then we are left with the inevitable conclusion that we simply haven't found any evidence yet. This is the exact logic that lies behind the rare earth hypotheses, hypotheses which is another possible resolution to the Fermi paradox. Or as already noted, it could be that this is the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself as a result of technological advancement. This could be the result of nuclear war, climate change, the development of artificial intelligence, or other means, as Sagan and Slavsky summarized in their 1966 The Quest for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Here's a quote. The temptation is to deduce that there are, at most, only a few advanced extraterrestrial civilization, either because we are one of the first technological civilizations who have emerged, or because it is the fate of all civilizations to destroy themselves to destroy themselves before they are much further along. This fucking article has a lot of things that distract me here and there, but that's what you get for a stoned podcast. <laughs> you want to dig Deadly Addictions channel, and I'm Addiction Master, so. Using humanity as a template, one could argue that the many extra existential threats we face are typical of civilizations at our level of development. There are many other proposed resolutions, such as ETIs, are not non-existent or dead, but hibernating, aka the astivation, <laughs> the astivation hypothesis. <laughs> There's the theory that they could be avoiding contact so they don't interfere with our evolution, the zoo hypothesis, or to protect themselves. <laughs> there are so many links and pot or things here. I could just do a whole series. I just keep doing this whole series of podcasts. I just keep hitting these links. And... Okay. All right, so that sounds somewhat okay. They're just they're being quiet. They're hiding themselves. So if that makes sense with another podcast I did. There were some ideas in there. It has even been suggested that humanity has been deliberately isolated by an ETI, a.k.a. the planetarium hypothesis, <laughs> so they can study us more closely. Of course, these are theories that, like the Fermi, pa Fermi paradox itself, cannot be resolved until evidence is found for the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. As famous as famed scientist and FC author Arthur C. Clarke once said, Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. <laughs> we have written many interesting articles about the Great Filter, the Fermi Paradox, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, SETI, and related concepts, concepts here at University Today. Uh, then they give, oh my god, this, this, so many, this would be like a five-year Pocket series. Mm -hmm. There are links everywhere for where are the aliens, how the Great Filter could attack tech, tech. 
And Beyond the Fermi Paradox. And I noticed, Jesus, a lot. Astronomy Cast has some interesting podcast sources. Okay, so we're done. This might have been a longer podcast than I planned, but I had these two websites, and one had a little more information, but, and I just, so I wound up doing them both, basically. I tried not to repeat this stuff. This was universetoday.com, an article written by Matt Williams, Beyond Fermi's Paradox 3. What is the Great Filter? So, we're done with this. I have a great growing curiosity about what could be going on in the universe with civilizations. These conversations started with a friend of mine and have blossomed into a real fun uh, investigation and uh, you know journey to just kind of understand these things. And in my wheel of uh, interest, which I make sure I cycle through so I don't stay in a rut too much. I pick things and inevitably I get stuck in them. So I do try to break it up. If you look at my playlist, I have, I still do a TV show podcast or movie podcast every once in a while. When I say I'm doing on the sciences, it could be something for mental health and, uh, you know, taking care of your pet. But I might stick to branching off on this theory or hypothesis uh, grouping concerning life in the universe. And I think it's interesting. That question about are we alone in the universe is a greater, more important question than is there a God or does none of that kind of make sense. This is something you could see being what people would label a God, right? So with that zoo hypothesis or the planetarium, there are aliens vastly powerful, so advanced technologically, millions of years, billion of years more advanced than us. And to them, they're, to us, they're God. So a lot of that is all embedded in these things. It's a lot to work out. But the crux of it is, what are the chances of life emerging, not only on Earth, but on other planets with other conditions? And are there some you know, replicas of Earth with the same exact uh, cycle of evolution. It's like so many variables, but it does make you think, looking out to the stars, we have done some great stuff. Now we got so many telescopes and satellites, probes that have gone beyond certain barriers, detecting the radiation coming in and out. We tracked a meteor 23 million light years from where it came from. We landed on a fucking asteroid and to bring him back, like, uh, things. This is all progress. If we can get through this great filter, I think we are creating our own bottleneck. There's enough shit going on. You can look right now in Israel and Palestine. Get these fucking people under control. Stop the bullshit. I don't care who's right or wrong at this point. Stop funding Israel and all the nonsense. There's Google videos and images you can see slavery happening as we as I speak. We have not become a new world order, although that's some conspiracy thing, but you know it's a good thing in the end. Do we get past this filter? I have hope for humanity. I have hope for uh, the generations that'll come, that will get through these things, and life will find a way. You know, I don't know. Maybe it takes the billions of years before our sun explodes. Maybe we get right to the crest of it, but so many things could happen. So science is where we go to look for the answers that best conform to our reality, that give us an understanding. This has been a really interesting series of podcasts to do. From these links, I'm finding other links I'm hitting and deciding if I'm going to do podcasts on that. So it's really gained my interest. I hope people are enjoying it. I hope you're doing well. The best to you and everybody you love. I'll talk to everybody next time. Farewell.